False worship is a problem from the beginning of time. See, people think false worship, idolatry, and you don't necessarily think this, but go right back to the garden. Did the serpent, did God really say? That's another way of deviating from the source. And in, in a, we'll call it a very ambiguous way, it does become false worship. And it's not that they bowed down and worshiped the serpent, but they listened to another voice taking the place of God. So you have a concept there. Our first parents did it. And as you travel through the Bible, this is the background I should have given, especially for our newer listeners. When you travel through the Bible, it starts right there at the beginning with our first parents, Adam and Eve. But as you travel through, you get to Moses, who delivers the children of Israel out of Egypt's bondage. And Moses has gone up to the mount. And he's been there for a time, and the people are getting impatient, and they basically beg Aaron. And Aaron says, okay, take off your jewelry, and he made a golden calf for them. Moses wasn't even down the mount with the first tables of first Ten Commandments or Tables of Stone while this is going on down below. And this is what's unfortunate. Moses doesn't even have a chance yet to tell the people, which will tell you God's insight or knowledge of our corrupt, evil way. Moses didn't even have a chance to get down the mount. And you read in Exodus 20, when God basically is giving him the tables, the, the tablets, the Ten Commandments. And he says, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, that's in the earth beneath, or that's in the water under the earth. And goes on to say, Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and so on. Isn't it interesting, though, that Moses is up on the mount getting these instructions, and what's happening down below is exactly what God is dictating above. He hasn't even gotten a chance to get down there. But I want you to see what's so crazy is that the first few lines of this, he doesn't say, first line is, thou shalt not kill right? First thing is, thou shalt have no other gods before me, not make any graven images, not worship them, not bow down to serve them. The insanity is while that's being spoken by God's mouth, the people down below are worshiping the golden calf. And worse than that is if you read carefully in that passage where it speaks of them making the golden calf, which I think is Exodus 32 if you're interested, Right there in that passage, what's so bizarre is it also says, you can miss this, it also says that Aaron built, in verse 5, Aaron saw it, built an altar before it, and Aaron made a proclamation that tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. So what is an altar? It's a place of worship. So he builds the golden calf, and he builds a place, an altar to worship at, breaking literally all the commandments God has just given Moses, although they have not seen or heard perhaps. But isn't it funny that those are the first things that God says, and this is the first thing that these people do out of Egypt's bondage. That's kind of interesting to see that God knows. Now, of course, Moses is angered by all this. And if you read in 32, I believe it's 19, came to pass as soon as he came nigh into the camp, he saw the calf and the dancing. And Moses' Moses' anger waxed, waxed hot, and he cast the tables of stone of his hands and break them beneath the mount. And... You have to go to Exodus 34 where God gives a second set and these will become essentially, we'll call them hidden away eventually. But what's interesting is it's like what the Apostle Paul said, until the law was given, there technically was no law, even though people still transgressed and sinned, but until God gave the law and then it became a sin. So it's kind of interesting that if you, you could even trace this back, I just chose the example of the children of Israel because it's the easiest one. I referenced Terah, Abraham's father, coming out of Ur of Chaldees, who we know definitively either made or worshipped idols. So th this has been a long battle since the beginning of time. And 
in our modern time, people might not think this. You might simply, for, for us perhaps as Protestants, we may immediately think, oh, the people that bow down before a statue of Mary, but don't even go there. That's, that's the obvious. What about the not so obvious? What about the false worship and bowing down to other things when we talk about how people would prefer money or success or fame over God? And that's another form of idolatry. You can call it whatever you want, but in the big picture, it all dovetails into what we're going to talk about. So it's interesting, no matter how good the person, you cannot eradicate certain evil that lives in the heart of humankind. Now, just to show you how it doesn't matter now, the law's been given, and you've got basically a long time, a big, we'll talk hundreds of years have elapsed, now I'm going to fast forward to the time of Solomon, and I'm giving you a, like a mini course through the Bible real quick to show you how even a king, son of King David, who was, David was a man after God's own heart, but Solomon was not. And it's very interesting, in 1 Kings 11, we know that it says Solomon loved many strange women. He did not listen to what God had said there was an admonition, I believe it occurs in Exodus 34, regarding foreign women and other things. And basically, we know that Solomon had a whole bunch of women, wives and concubines. And you read at verse 4, For it came to pass when Solomon was old, this is 1 Kings 11, For it came to pass when Solomon was old that his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Zidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. And Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord, and went not fully after the Lord, as did David his father. And then it says, Then did Solomon build a high place for Shemosh, the abomination of Moab, in the hill that is just, that is before Jerusalem, and for Molech, the abomination of the children of Ammon. And likewise, he did for all his strange wives, which burnt incense and sacrificed unto their gods. So you can see that even though, even a king, right, didn't matter. And so we know this. We know that because of Solomon's departure from God, God basically says through the prophet in Solomon's time, basically because of your wickedness, when you die the kingdoms will be torn apart. Right now, Solomon is the king of one united kingdom. But, and it's, it actually, if you read on in that same chapter, it speaks of this. It says in, in verse 13, How be it, I will not rend away all the kingdom, but I will give one tribe to thy son David, my servant's sake, and for Jerusalem's sake, which tells you there's going to be a split of north and south. But everything will stay together God says, not for Solomon's sake, but for David's sake, until Solomon dies. Once Solomon dies in 931 B.C., the kingdom split. Tribes and land to the north, Israel. Tribes and land to the south, Judah. And I've given the explanation last week, so if you didn't hear that, you might want to listen again. If you have a Bible like mine, there are some great maps that show the division. That's very easy to get a good picture. But... I do want to show you something. This will show you a little bit of what went on. I put two lists together to show you the southern kings and the northern kings. And I will try and do this better perhaps for the future to stretch them because they are not necessarily even. As you can see, for example, Rehoboam is in 931. So is Jeroboam. But then because of different times, they are not reigning simultaneously. There may have been one king for 20 years in one place and one king in, in the other place for five years or in some cases seven or eight days. But I basically, to just kind of make it easy, I have here, when I say Rehoboam, 17 bad years, for example, we're talking about the fact that his, not that he had a bad uh, reign, but that he was a bad king, that he did bad things or evil things in the sight of God. And probably the most Egregious one starts with Jeroboam right here. And this is kind of interesting. So Jeroboam, for example, 
This is right after the kingdom split. He sets up in two different places, at Dan and Bethel. He sets up, he, he makes two golden calves, builds altars, sets this up to rival Solomon's temple, to prohibit the people, to prevent them from going to the temple. And if that's not bad enough, he creates his own version of the priesthood, not ordained by God, even though I could in my mind say, well, he was still trying, but the way he did it was wrong anyway. Then he, he creates a pilgrimage festival, making it the date of his own choosing, not even in alignment with any other festival that was currently going on. And this kind of starts a whole procedure, if you will, but it's there that right there at the, at the rending of the kingdoms, Jeroboam implements this, and unfortunately, you've got a whole bunch of other bad guys that follow. So I'll show you the list and the motley lineup. I put this here in blue to show you. This is the beginning of the Assyrian force starting to pick up and take traction. And then here we have the next batch of people here. As you know, Uzziah is the, is the one that Isaiah sees when he says, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. And then these three kings we'll come back to. They are important because they are in the opening of our book. But as you can see here, I put here, so 722, the fall of Israel to Assyria, exile, deportation. You've got Shalemineser, the fifth in 722 BC. Sennacherib 701 gets as far as Jerusalem but fails to invade. And then here's a very bizarre thing, which I don't know if I'll make it to all of these today or any of these today, but here's a real piece of work for you. Here's Manasseh, who is Hezekiah's son, who basically, in a nutshell, is he is probably the most evil. Now, there were some really evil kings, but he's the most evil. He, he reigns for 55 years. He sacrifices at least one of his children to Moloch. He's a mass murderer. He basically undoes all the good that his father Hezekiah tried to re-implement, turning the people back away and plunging them back into this dark period once more. So it's kind of one of those things that you have to really take note of. And then I went as far as to kind of bring you to the Babylonian Empire. Here, basically, the Assyrian Empire is at its height and then you have the fall of Judah, Babylon around this. This is the last king, Zedekiah, 11 bad years, and the fall and deportation in 586 of Judah. So that gives you a, an idea. And all of that is to say it's important for us to kind of put meat and potatoes around something like what we're looking at. If you don't have a frame of reference, it's kind of like reading one-dimensional, you're looking at something very flat. We need to bring this to life to be able to understand the times that people lived in were pretty bleak. Uh, if I went back to, for example, here, sorry to do this to you, but let me show you one of these and give you an example. Here is, right down here, it's a, an earlier king, Ahab, and I put here 22. There's an asterisk. When I put an asterisk there, it means really bad, all right? Uh, <laughs> So Ahab, for example, you have Ahab in 853, Shalmaneser III and King Ahab, of, they come face to face in the Battle of Karkar. Ahab is mortally wounded. He dies, his body is brought back, and his son takes the throne, rules for two years. He dies receiving injuries in another battle at the palace, and it just seems like a revolving door but for all these people, there is literally, when I put bad, there's enough bad. Jehu, for example, king of Israel in 841, he did eliminate Baal worship. That is another god. The Assyrian king Shalmaneser III, who fought against Ahab at the Battle of Karkar, mounted another attack. This is recorded. This is what's interesting, is you can get history from this book, First Kings, Second Kings, and Chronicles. You can also get it from the secular records, and this is an interesting one. This particular thing I just mentioned about Jehu is very important. One, because the stele that was uncovered in 1846 by Laird at Nimrud records that Jehu, the son of Omri, on this stele, Jehu, the son of Omri, paid tribute to Shalomaneser. 
And what's interesting is on that stele, if you look it up, there is an image. I believe it's one of the few late images of any of the kings after the depictions of David and perhaps Solomon, where Jehu is seen on his knees pleading before the Assyrian king. It's very interesting, but that is something you can look up online and kind of get, wrap your mind around that there are a lot of secular proofs beyond even the Bible when people say, well, is all this true? Well, if you're going to look up Assyrian records, just be braced for one thing. They may use completely different names. They would be names in their own language. We have names that have been translated for us into English, so please don't go. But the names are not the same. That's what happens when you translate. Now, I mentioned, of course, Hezekiah and Hezekiah's son. So when we finally get to the 8th century, and we're now in the period of Micah, that's why I said to you, remember, take a good look at, let's go there now to Micah. You kind of start to take a look at that opening passage where it says, the word of the Lord that came to Micah, the Morshite, in the days of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, which he saw concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. So that's why I said to you, it's kind of an important thing to just take a look. It kind of gives you a little bit of a timeline there. Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah. So we're dealing with these kings, and this is the time that Micah lived in. I also said to you last week that the prophets of this time You've got Isaiah, who is a prophet to the kingly court. The time don't make them necessarily add up like this. They are staggered somewhat, and they're writing in different places at different times. But you've got Micah, Isaiah, Hosea, and Amos, and they, they may be at the tail end or the beginning of. They're not all lined up uniquely. But if you take those prophets' teaching and you put them together, you really get a good glimpse of the moral depravity of the people, really sunk into very dark places. Now let me, I'm gonna bounce back and forth, don't hate me for this, but this is what I've been trying to say for weeks, months, maybe years. I'm not asking people to become Bible thumpers and think that somehow you come to church and you, you lose your life, you become a monastic squarehead, but I am saying that without some spiritual compass, that is rooted in a foundation. Remember, one of the prophets said, without vision, the people perish. But what is the vision? Is the vision all the power that's in you and all the potential that's in you? Or is the vision what God has said for his people? So without that vision, it is true, the people perish. And this is why we are seeing in this country a moral decline with a social decline and, of course, obviously, it's axiomatic, a spiritual decline. We see the prophet address the normal theocracy of Judah attacking the very core of what they had abandoned. They've be, we're going to get into the book in a minute. They'd become self-absorbed, greedy, departing from serving and worshiping the living God. There's an interesting passage. Actually, I'm going to turn to it to show you something in case some of you are not Bible explorers per se. In Jeremiah 26, and as you know, Jeremiah comes a little bit later. In Jeremiah 26, 18. Let me go back a little bit. Then rose up a certain of the elders of the land and spake all the assembly of the people, saying, Micah, the Moreshev, prophesied in the days of Hezekiah, king of Judah, and spake to all the people of Judah, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Zion shall be plowed like a field, and Jerusalem shall become heaps and the mountain of the house of, as the high places of a forest. Did Hezekiah, king of Judah, and all Judah put him at all to death? So basically it's interesting that right there in the book of Jeremiah we have a mention of didn't Micah prophesy this thing? Now what's interesting, and I just say it is interesting, can you imagine if you were living after the time of Micah knew what Micah's prophecies about the demise of what he was preaching against that actually happened in 722. And he also foretold of the Babylonians and the demise in 586. So can you imagine living 
in Jeremiah's time and being in Jeremiah's time. And remember, Jeremiah is part of the prophet that is going to be carried away like the rest of these. So it's very interesting. For me, it would be eyes wide open. There would, there wouldn't be, you wouldn't have to give me another sign because I've said before, and I'll repeat again, the test of a prophet is if what he says comes to pass, and you better believe that's a prophet of God because it's God speaking through that individual. Now, just to be clear, in this day and age, I love it when I meet people and they say, well, my name is Prophet so-and-so. <laughs> okay, tell me what I had for breakfast. <laughs> in today's meaning, see, a lot of things have changed with the dispensation and the coming of Christ. Today's meaning, when we talk about a prophet, when the Apostle Paul says God gave some prophets, some teachers, some evangelists, and so forth for the perfecting of the saint, in, in this day and age, it means the bubbling forth of God's word. It is something that comes forth out of the individual. It's not a new revelation. We know there will be no new revelations. All that has been and shall be is contained in this book. So it is only the word of God bubbling forth out of that individual. So that person can be called a prophet for that sake, but not in the sake of divination or foretelling that. There may be those people who may have random gifts, but the likelihood of that being a true gift in this day and age is very, very slim, all right? So let's get into the text, into the book of Micah, and let's take a look at, because I would like to review a little bit of, and give more of an overview, a review, because I need to move on and go forward here. So, of course, the word of the Lord that came to Micah the Morshite, in the days of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, which he saw concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. The structure of this opening, verses 1, literally through the 16th uh, verse, so the whole first chapter, is very much like if you would look at a lawsuit from antiquity. And you say, what, what is that? <laughs> well, you gotta, if you read clay tablets, you can find lots of those. People took people to court or took people to the law, and it's structured very much the same way. There is the judge, which is God, calling all to witness their testimony, the charges against them, both Samaria and Jerusalem. There is a judgment against Samaria and a whole bunch of other things I'll get into. But it's very much, you know, you can read this and kind of scratch your head or you can read this and look at this and say, this is a little bit like a lawsuit, laying out each part, each party, who's going to do what, why, and even elaborating as to what the charges are. So, as I told you last week, verses 2, 3, and 4, but the opening of verse 2 could be, could technically, hear, ye, hear all ye people, hearken, O earth. That could be, in the moment, speaking to the people in the now, but he goes from speaking in the now to speaking of a future time when he says, O earth and all that therein is, and let the Lord God be witness against you, the Lord from his holy temple. For behold, the Lord cometh forth out of his place and will come down and tread upon the high places of the earth. We cannot miss two things. Yes, Jerusalem was on a hill, not a very big hill, but on a hill and considered a high place for that reason. But high places are referencing the places of false worship. That is the reference right there. And the mountain shall be molten under him, and the valley shall be cleft as wax before the fire, as the waters that are poured down a steep place. Let me just stop there because here we have the effects of God coming to earth described in verse 4. And I'm going to ask you this question, which is rhetorical, but you can answer it anyway. Did this happen? Did God come down to earth and make all this change? Not yet. All right? So... There's something to be said about that, and I, I've also pointed out, if you're interested in understanding more about this, you have definitely got to read some of the passages of Zechariah, some of the passages of Daniel. There's a lot of different things that have to be put together for you to see the whole. But here comes the beginning charges for the transgression of Jacob is all this, and for the sins of the house of Israel. What is the transgression of Jacob? Is it not Samaria? And what are the high places of Judah? Are they not Jerusalem? 
there is idol worship going on everywhere. And the reason why I gave you the list of kings at your leisure, and it's one of those kind of, it's what I call a rabbit hole. Start reading about these different kings. Don't even do it from the Bible. Go to secular sources. Just don't use Wikipedia. That's like, you know, I can't tell people this enough. Oh, I looked up on Wikipedia. Okay, well, if you want information, don't go there. Real information. But here's the thing. What becomes interesting is you see that what started, and I go back to Solomon, what started with Solomon basically spread out like tentacles. See, people don't typically take up the good traits and the good They gravitate towards the evil and the lesser. And this is a very, uh, we'll call it a very easy thing. None of these idols, none of these gods required anything but maybe a votive offering of devotion or fire or incense and periodically, yes, offering your children into the fire. That's not a lot to ask. But not as much in their minds as what was required by them under God's law. So just think about that for a minute. Now, in verse 8, and I'm jumping a little bit ahead, but in verse 8, you have the prophet himself lamenting, and that whole section ends by verse 16 by talking about mourning for the situation. This, as I said, is structured. If you read it carefully, you'll see the structure inside, the way it's put together. The writing, by the way, uh, a lot of people... Uh, have commented on this, that somehow it's put together too nicely to have been written in one fell swoop. I actually agree. I believe that this probably was written at different times and then collated together by the author, not by a different author. A lot of people have a lot of opinions. We can circle back to that if we want to in a different message. But I do want to distinguish between God coming down and executing judgment versus God using other tools. If you remember way back there, God used the Chaldeans to set the people, God's people straight. Here he will use the Assyrians to get his message across, and he'll eventually use the Babylonians to get his message across. So God isn't always necessarily using the good and the righteous. Sometimes he uses the bad and the ugly to get what he needs to get done. So now let me revisit briefly the play on those cities, just real quickly as a review. When he says to them, declare ye not at Gath, weep ye not at all, just remember that Gath, still probably for many in the minds of many, still remain that enemy territory. Don't tell it to your enemies so that they can ridicule you. They'll laugh at you and you'll be basically a laughing stock. So don't tell it there. But then he begins a play on words. In the house of Aphra, in the house of dust, roll thyself in the dust. And when he says, pass ye away, thou inhabitant of Saphir, having thy shame and having thy shame naked. So Saphir, pleasant town, you'll go away in shameful nakedness, not so pleasant. And then in Zanan, came not forth in the morning of Beth Ezel, he shall receive you of his standing. So Zanan, inhabitants of the going out, shall not go out. Beth Ezel, the people of the foundation, will lose their foundation or their support. Maroth, which is bitter. Imagine bitter town. You live in bitter town and you're waiting for good, but only evil is going to come to you. Lachish, as I said, probably the genesis of it all for this particular prophet. The team of horses will latch up their team, but they won't charge. They'll retreat. Morasheth Gath, inhabitants of the betrothed. I know you can't read that in the English, but if you go to a Hebrew text and if you have a Hebrew interlinear, use that plus some helps to look up the words and you'll find it is, it's an interesting play. In fact, this book has a lot of different puns and plays on words that are hidden. Because of our English version, you can't see it, unfortunately. So Morasheth Gath, inhabitants of the betrothed. You'll be betrothed, basically your new husband, Assyria, king of Assyria to Achzib, the houses of Achzib shall be a lie to the kings of Israel. I'm trying to see, that's verse 14, and in the margin it says a lie. So that's interesting. 
a lie or deceit, inhabitants of lie or deceit, you will be true to your names and deceitful to the kings of Israel. And so you get the idea here. The last one here, he shall come unto Adullam, the glory of Israel. Again, because it's worded so poorly, I'm going to say it like this. All the glory that's there will go hide in the cave. We know Adullam is associated with David. It should have rung in the minds of the hearers even because they would have been familiar with the stories of King David having gone into the cave of Adullam. So all of these are a play on words and basically an indictment of another kind against these people that basically now he, Micah picks just a few towns, but it's basically an indictment on these people not standing by the stuff. And the stuff here is God's word and God. So he says basically this is what's going to happen. Chapter 2 begins what I call a woe oracle, combined with an announcement of judgment which will consist of several reversals of fortune for the wrongdoers. Woe to them that devise iniquity and work evil upon their beds. When the morning is light, they practice it because it is in the power, it is in the power of their hand. Now, let me kind of just say, he's going to talk about several things here. I'm going to try and figure out where I want to jump in. Let me read a bit more, and then I'll jump in to make some commentary and bring some clarity to this. And they covet fields and take them by violence, and houses take them away. So they oppress a man in his house, even a man in his heritage. Therefore thus saith the Lord, Behold, against this family do I devise an evil, from which ye shall not remove your necks, neither shall ye go hardly, for this time is evil. Now here's what's interesting. First thing is by adding fields to their fields, and I want, just, I want you to really wrap your mind around this. By adding fields to their fields, these people could control agriculture and therefore they could control society. Does that even ring anything close to something that's happening today? Okay? So there's a lot of different things going on here that I said you, you can't read this and go, this is not striking a chord with me. From the issues of greed and covetousness, covetousness, Micah will focus on a curse that certain families will have no representation left to stake their claim or their lot, which, of course, according to these people, is very important to have a stake in the land, to claim your heritage, and so forth. Then he goes on to talk about some other things, which I'm going to verse 4. In that day shall one take up a parable against you, and lament with a doleful lamentation, and say, We be utterly spoiled. He hath changed the portion of my people. How hath he removed it from me? Turning away, he hath divided our fields. Therefore thou shalt have none that shall cast a cord by lot in the congregation of the Lord. So let me stop here and let me go back and explain a little bit. These people, they sleep on their, they, they are on their beds at nighttime, devising cunning schemes of how to take and steal other people's land or property. And in the daytime, they carry out their nocturnal schemes by going and seizing what's not theirs to take. Does that sound familiar at all? <laughs> if it doesn't, you're living under a rock somewhere. Now, he's going to go on to talk about these false preachers, which is, again, strikes a chord with me for what goes on in this day and age. Prophesy ye not, say they to them that prophesy, they shall not prophesy to them, that they shall not take shame. Let me talk about that for a minute, because there's so many things going on here, I'm trying to figure out where to start first. First thing is, and it's important to point this out. When he says, prophesy ye not, they were prophesying, but they weren't prophesying anything that A, was of God. B, if they were really of God, they would have been telling the people, turn back or judgment's coming. And it's kind of interesting because they would have the people in this day and age, if a prophet would have come and said, I have a new gospel called the gospel of wine, booze, and strong drink, that would have gathered a following. And people would follow after that. Now, just let me elaborate on that because this, 
This is what makes me cringe. How can somebody read this book and not realize that that happens today in this day and age when people come along and they say, I have a gospel that will make people rich. I have a gospel that when it, it taps into every dimension of humanity's darkest places and people just get scooped up and they go along with it and they get carried up with it. Some of it is under the guise of good. If you remember the guy that, and there have been so many of these, this guy that claimed to be a healer and people, desperate people, lined up. And of course, then it's, it's found out afterwards that the guy's, you know, he's uh, getting high and drinking. And of course, when he comes out, they all think he's full of the spirit, right? Like he was full of spirits, that's for sure. But these poor people that, uh, again, listen, if you don't do your due diligence, shame on you, okay? I'm not asking you to scrutinize the person, but listen to what they're saying. You know how many people, how many messages I get, especially from that Renew channel of people saying, you know, I first started listening to you and I was very skeptic because originally there were a lot of religious programmers there. And I say religious, that's all they were. And so people hear one charlatan, they think, well, everybody on there must be that. How many people will call and say, I was skeptical, but I started listening, I realized what you're doing is straight out of the Bible, it's solid stuff, you have my attention. Who on TV, in fact, many of these people saying, you don't ask for a dime. No, I expect you to listen and then figure out it's your responsibility to respond. I'm not going to beat you over the head to do it. That's between you and God. If you can't figure out what is your responsibility before God, well, I'll tell you once or twice. I'll teach it to you many times, but I'm not in the, my, my thing is not to say, well, I'm going to stand here and I'm going to make sure that you do your part. No, you don't do your part. The consequences fall on you. I'm just the mouthpiece to tell you what to do, and I'm not, in the, I'm, not inclined to, I'm not inclined to guilt people. If you can't see the truth and recognize it, then probably you'll never see it. It'll never come to you, and you will be locked in your own pile of skabala. How's that? That was the nicest, cleanest way to say what I really wanted to say. <laughs> All right, so let me get back to the text here. And I'm actually going to finish a portion of this because then I can go back and make a whole commentary on this. He says, O thou that are named the house of Jacob, is the spirit of the Lord straightened? If you look up that word in Strong's 7114, you'll have a lot of different words attached to it, uh, vexed, annoyed, sometimes translated reap, sometimes short. But it's hard to see that there's there's multiple voices speaking here. So perhaps it's like this. O oh, thou that art named the house of Jacob, is the spirit of the Lord vexed or, or angry? Are these his doings? Now watch the transition. Do not my words do good to him that walketh uprightly. There's actually maybe two or three speakers in there. And when I have time to do this, I'll do a proper translation and show it to you so you can see there are two or three voices speaking in there. But what should be understood is, to those people, do not my words do good to him that walketh uprightly. Think of it this way. A man or a woman walking in God's word, listen carefully, is blessed just for the mere part of understanding the desire to walk in it and be a part of God's program. Blessing, I don't mean as in abundant things around you. That could happen, but it may not. O thou that are named the house of Jacob is the spirit of the Lord straightened. Are these his doings? Do not my words do good to him that walketh uprightly. Now, it's a warped person would say, of course, in their own minds, they're doing what they think is the Lord's work, and therefore they are receiving good. But in fact, it's the complete opposite. Even of late my people, and that translation is terrible, it should say something like, even yesterday, even as early as yesterday, my people is risen up as an enemy. You pull off the robe with the garment from them that pass by securely as men averse from war. Just taking, just seizing what is not yours. Does that ring a bell anywhere? This is going on rampantly. And you don't think that there's a correlation between the lack of moorings in a faith that's rooted in this book, we'll call it Judeo-Christian moorings, and what's going on out there in the world that was happening in the, in the days of, not just Micah, it's long. It's a long list. The women of my people have ye cast out from their pleasant homes. 
From their children you have taken away my glory forever. Arise ye and depart, for this is not your rest. And that's a very important word. Verse 10, not your rest. Basically, you are not going to remain here. You will be banished from this land. When they talk about rest in the land, like the children of Israel entered in, those few that entered into the land to obtain rest, that means they could settle there. This is saying you will not remain here. Now the prophet is building up this indictment against these people to ultimately tell them what their judgment and fate is going to be. If a man walking in the spirit and falsehood do lie, saying, I will prophesy unto thee, of here, here's the passage I was telling you, of wine and of strong drink, he shall even be the prophet of this people. So they'll believe anything if it sounds good and plausible to them. But don't think about going back to the absoluteness of God's word. Just take a man at his word, whatever or whatever he or she says that sounds, that sounds good and pleasing. And this is my grievance. It has been my grievance for so long, you're probably tired of me grieving about this. But way too many people go into a church and they feel good listening to a message. And I'm not telling you you should feel terrible leaving the church, but you should have a lot going on in your brain. You should be masticating on every word that was spoken to think of how this can be applied. What should I do? Should I pray about this? Should I meditate? Do I need to study more? I don't understand. I need to stay tuned. I need to keep learning. But, and I'm saying there are messages I've preached which make people feel really good. They come right out of this book. But if every attempt of mine is to please you, then I am doing the very antithesis of what I've been called to do. A man or a woman cannot please God if they are seeking to please man. That, these two things from the book itself, from the word and from God's mouth himself, cannot exist together. In fact, for those preachers and those prophets and those ministers who seek the approval of the vast populace. Stay away from those people. I am not afraid to speak the truth. That is what has made a lot of enemies for me. A lot of people do not like me. They say, well, you could be nicer. Yeah, I could be. But how is there a nice way to tell someone they're going to hell? Is there a kind way to tell someone that you're going the wrong way? Listen, I'm nobody's police person. I'm just, I'm pointing and opening up the truth of God's word. If you don't want to hear it, that's your problem. But don't hate the messenger. If you want to, that's fine. I'm not here to be liked by you. I'm actually here to do one particular thing, and that is fulfill the calling to open up God's word, to make it understandable for us to grow, as I've said, in grace together. And if you're liking me because I'm doing that, that's okay but not for any other reason. There's no reason to say, well, you know, all these people want to build up so-and-so and, -so and oh, they're the greatest, they're the nicest. Well, trust me, you haven't probably spent an hour with them and what niceties they come across as on television. I guarantee you behind closed doors and particularly one of those, one of those more famous evangelists, I'm telling you, his wife wears the pants. All right, so anyway, just, just saying, all right, just, you know, listen, you're gonna, it's gonna come out of my mouth anyway. What's in here comes out. You don't have to worry, okay? So, could you put a filter on it? Maybe. But let me go back to the book now, and I'm going to actually read from my photocopies because I cannot make sense of <laughs> what's in my... There's just too much going on there. So let me go back to my photocopy of the page, and here we go. All of this lined up kind of line by line, going back to the first place where it says, you know, they devise evil at nighttime, they carry it out in the daytime. And then basically they're building field by field, why? Or house by house and every man taking away his heritage, why? Because they can control the people and they can oppress the lower class. And in this particular day and age, people who had a lot of possessions also controlled the politicians. Hmm. That's a novel concept right there. Does that happen in this day anymore? Oh, well, of course not. Therefore, thus, you see, you, can, you cannot escape how evil humanity is through the ages until today. You cannot escape it. It's everywhere. We haven't gotten better, by the way. We've gotten worse. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, behold, against this family do I devise an evil which you will not remove your necks. You're not going to recover from. 
So we see what God is basically saying, I've had enough. Now, unlike other prophets who called the people back and said, repent, it's not too late. There's judgment coming here. It's as if, it's as if God has said, I have given you enough warning, generation after generation. I've given you enough mercy, generation after generation. And still you won't change, you won't listen. I'm asking you a question. Not maybe not necessarily to my main audience, but people who are just what I call fence sitter listeners, not necessarily into the book, kind of indifferent. What will it take for you to recognize we are at a turning point and a pivotal place for our country to turn back to its moorings, to get back to an original concept of what we should believe in as a people. I'm not saying we all need to believe the same thing. That will never happen. This is America, the greatest melting pot on earth, okay? And I'm all for that. That's what makes this country great. But certain things that made this country great as well were certain things that were not changing. And those things are changing rapidly because people have become detached from what matters the most. So, now, there's a couple of other things being said I want to cover, and then we will kind of wrap this up. He says now, verse 12, 13, is a future not yet fulfilled. He says, I will surely assemble, O Jacob, all of thee. I will surely gather the remnant of Israel, and I will put them together. This is what's important. A lot of people don't, because they don't know prophecy, you got to go to the book of Ezekiel to read how God will put the two sticks back together in one hand. They shall become one. When that happens, you can know that God's fulfilling what's being said right here, which has not happened yet. A lot of people reading this say, oh, well, it's, uh, it's the state of Israel. No, my friends, it's not the state of Israel. I will surely assemble, O Jacob, all of thee. I will surely gather the remnant of Israel. I will put them together as the sheep of Basra, Basra being the capital or the chief city of Edom, historically noted for its tremendous population of sheep. So there's a pictorial image being painted here. As, as the flock in the midst of their fold, they shall make great noise by reason of the multitude of men. In essence, there, it will be a number so innumerable. Do not think this is just looking at a small band of people. This is talking about a future time the breaker has come up before them. They have broken up and have passed through the gate and are gone out by it. And their king shall pass before them and the Lord on the, on the head of them. Now, you may not see the connection here because there's so much being said. And I hate to do this because I'm going to dump something on you right now. I always tell you when there's a dump coming. Here's a dump. This is talking about a future time. And we know, A, as I said, it's talking about a future time because... This has not happened yet. The two houses have not been brought back together in one hand as, as the two sticks of Ezekiel have been joined back together. It has not happened yet. And using this pictorial sense of the sheep of Basra making a great noise by reason of the multitude of men, that has not happened, all right? And then this part, when it says, the breakers come up before them, they have broken up and have passed through the gate. Let me stop there. What gate? Please don't answer it. It's a rhetorical question for the moment. What gate do you think this prophet is talking about? See, in, in his day, even for people reading this, it, it may or may not make sense, but for us looking backwards and now knowing what we know about the future, it makes perfect sense. There were eight gates to the city of Jerusalem, the Golden Gate, Lion's Gate, Herod's Gate, Damascus Gate, Jaffa Gate, Zion Gate, and the Dung Gate. This would be the first temple. Then you've got Nia, Maya, and Ezra that rebuild the walls from the Sheep Gate north, the Hananiel Tower, I taught on this before, the Fish Gate, the Furnace Tower, the Temple Mount at the southwest corner, the Dung Gate to the south, the East Gate that technically would sit beneath the Golden Gate. The East Gate and the Golden Gate are technically one and the same. The Golden Gate has many other names. Do not think it's the bridge in California. Uh, like the Gate of Mercy. And what's interesting is, by the way, because I don't think I've departed, and this is a sidebar, it's not, it's exactly directed to this. Even the Quran says that on the Day of Judgment, the just will pass through this gate. 
And there's a, an interesting thing. It's, it's not specified what gate. It just says the gate. But we know it's the east gate. Why? Because every gate to the city to this day is still open except for the east gate. And the east gate was closed in 810 AD, reopened in 1102 by the Crusaders, then walled up by Saladin after regaining Jerusalem in 1137. In 1530, the Ottoman Turks, of course, added the great stones to the gate and did something else. They added a cemetery in front of the gate, deliberately thinking that a Jewish messiah would never set foot in a cemetery, making him ceremonial unclean. Therefore, that would guarantee that Messiah, Jewish Messiah, would never come through that gate. Ezekiel himself, the prophet Ezekiel, prophesied of the shutting of this gate. And by 1541, Suleiman the Great, or the Magnificent, had the gate walled up, and it has stayed shut to this day. All the prophecies concerning Christ talk about that is the gate through which he shall come. And trust me when I tell you, that if he came out of the grave, that would mean by their logic he's already defiled, even though he's perfectly pure, holy, and whole, and alive. But in their minds, he'd be, he'd be mortified to go through a cemetery. When, listen to me. Our Bible tells us that he went down to minister to the departed souls. Uh, Methinks he's already been there, done that, so I don't think it's going to make a big difference. So what I'm saying to you is, right there, remember I told you about prophecy, prophets speaking in a current time, talking about current events, and then he dodges off just like that on a turn of a dime to talk about something future. When he says, the breakers come up before them, they have broken up and have passed through the gate and are gone out by it, and their king shall pass before them and the Lord on the head of them. This is so interesting to me that one man could be given by God both the mouthpiece to be the heralder of judgment to a people for their sinfulness and at the same time herald a tremendous messianic hope for the future. So mind-boggling to me, in fact, when you look at this and parse this in Hebrew, it even becomes more, <laughs> more mind-boggling. This is why I love language and maybe, who knows, I might pick this apart in detail. I don't want to turn some of you off because I can go really deep into the language. Some of you are like, oh, <laughs> no more Hebrew, please. But what I'm saying to you, though, is it is truly amazing because why? The things that he foretold of telling of the people being carried away eventually, not their land, they'll be taken away, and he, he did foretell that they would not stay there. He also, by the way, Micah also foretells of the fate of the other kingdom, which comes to pass, but at a later time. What's mind-boggling, though, that enough of what he said came to pass already, and the bulk of what we've looked at has come to pass. So the few things that have not yet been fulfilled tell me and speak volumes to the fact that not only is Micah declaring these things, but you've got several other prophets that lived at different times in different places who probably did not read or know Micah's prophecies, who wrote in similar or same fashion about the coming of our Lord, about how he will enter, what will happen topographically, how things will change, how a floodgate of people, all nations, we don't think of it this way. I told you a passage out of Isaiah that speaks of these would be descendants of perhaps Ishmael, which we tend to group whole cloth into Arabs, and they are not. They are a bunch of different people. I'll explain that one day. But that these will come, and they will come to the mount, and they too shall worship he who has come, Messiah, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. So when I tell you prophecy is amazing, because it should, it should scare us a little bit to see that what he said and fortify our faith, what he said came to pass, but it should also give us this great comfort for people that think, well, how do you know that this is actually going to happen? What proof do you have? Well, as I said, and I'll repeat it again for probably the fifth time, the test of a prophet is what if what he says comes to pass. And if I were to isolate just from this book alone what he prophesied that came true versus the portions that remain to be fulfilled, which kind of line up pretty much even, but the ones that he declared already, both in his lifetime and after he died, that came to pass, that's a pretty darn good track record. So I'm going to stay by the stuff, and it actually excites me to know when I start reading about the future time, the return of our Lord, how things will be, and it will not be 
everything is pleasant immediately. We know that there'll be a period of time of great tribulation, tribulation, the great tribulation, and then there will be a time of what we call recreation, and we'll call it that eternal place that we were all meant to be at, designed as followers of Christ to be with him. And so I just look at this and think to myself, if, if all of what he said came to pass already, I'm looking forward to the future and I'm going to stay by this stuff. And unlike the people who didn't heed the warning, I don't need to be warned and I don't need to hear about impending judgment, but I would like to warn others that just take God and treat him just like the people in Micah's day, very loosely and very glibly. Remember what the Apostle Paul said, be not mocked, be not deceived, be not, be not deceived. God is not mocked for whatever a man sows, he shall also reap, or he'll reap that which he also sows. So in, in essence, and that is a word to all of mankind, that's not just limited to us who believe, but anyone who recognizes what I'm saying. You've got to stop for a minute and think, should I take another look at this? And perhaps if all of this is yet to come, it means I've got time for those people out there, the quintessential fence sitters. I've got time to start learning about God. It's never too late to start learning and knowing the one who, by faith, you say, I place my trust in him. I will spend eternity with him. So will you. So I'm not going to leave this on a sour or fearful note. I'm going to leave this on a note that says, the future may look a little shaky, but God is still in control. That's my message. I'm Pastor Melissa Scott, pastor of Faith Center, Glendale, California. I teach every Sunday morning at 11 a.m. If you'd like to attend services with us, simply call the 800 number, that is 800-338-3030, to join us. If you'd like to watch, listen, and learn 24 hours a day, simply log on to our website at www.pastormelissascott.com.